Good morning. Uh, Joseph, are we are we live? All right, thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking Joseph and Cheryl and the ITS team for working long extra hours um, yesterday overnight, early morning, to double and triple back up the live stream uh, so that it works um, continuously today. Uh, there were a, a little bit of uh, technical problems yesterday, it had nothing to do with our team here, had nothing to do with the company that uh, provides the live streaming. It was something happening in Virginia on the internet highway where somebody was not letting us through for some reason. <laughs> We're not going to say conspiracy. But <laughs> oh, I did say it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to get started uh, here with uh, our first session this morning, uh, Green Jobs and Sustainable Finance. Uh, our speakers, Matt Forstatter, Rob Parento, and Scott Fulweiler, uh, need no introductions. Uh, so with that, we'll start with uh, Matt Forstatter. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome back to our conference. And as uh, Fadl uh, said, I'm going to be talking about green jobs and a little bit about green infrastructure. So the question that I want to use as my point of departure is uh, based on some of what Randy Ray was discussing last night, that's the inherent instability of the economy. So can green jobs, and when I say green jobs, <coughs> of course I'm going to have to clarify what I mean by green jobs, because people mean different things by that term. Uh, but n not only that, uh, when I say green jobs, I really mean a policy package. Uh, policies should almost never be instituted uh, just as a single policy uh, because there always will be uh, side effects or uh, anticipated unintended effects, and so you almost always want a package of policies together, especially if you're talking about an issue as complex and diverse as a transition toward a sustainable economy, a sustainable society. And so uh, when I say green jobs, I uh, also include the integration of a uh, functional finance approach to managing government budgets and the national debt uh, and the monetary system more generally uh, with ecological tax reform. Um, the use of a variety of taxes, subsidies, quotas, and so on. Uh, to try to encourage sustainable behaviors and uh, discourage um, unsustainable behaviors. So can green jobs stabilize an unstable economy? Um, so how we answer the question uh, depends on our definition of green jobs, the assumptions behind the analysis and the other parts of the total policy package. So there are two sets of problems, economic and environmental. Capitalism, unregulated or badly regulated capitalism, is both macroeconomically uh, unstable and environmentally unsustainable. And we all know what the macro problems are, beginning with unemployment, uh, which is 
directly and indirectly related to uh, virtually every uh, social problem, major social problem that we have, poverty, inequality, um, and we need to solve the unemployment problem without um, uh, a sacrifice of uh, price stability. Uh, as Randy talked about, there's the financial instability issue and so on. On the environmental side, the economic system has to satisfy uh, certain sustainability rules regarding things like the relationship between the quantities of different emissions uh, in relation to the assimilative capacity of the environment, uh, both locally and globally. Uh, so we can't, uh, we can't um, pollute uh, more than the ability of the assimilative capacity to deal effectively uh, with uh, those emissions. Some emissions, of course, uh, are not assimilable in any uh, quantity at all, mercury, cadmium, and so on. But for, for <clears throat> those that are, there are limits in terms of the quantity of emissions per time period in a geographic region, and uh, the relationship between the rate of um, stock renewable resource utilization and the rate of renewal or rate of growth of stock renewable uh, resources. Um, because unlike flow renewables or sometimes called perpetual resources like uh, solar and wind or um, uh, I just go to hydro energy, the, the energy, you know, uh, that results from the movement of water, right? Um, the, Though those perpetual resources or flow renewables, um, they're not available, you know, in infinite quantities. Uh, the definition of the flow renewable would be that um, no matter how much of these <coughs> resources we use, the same amount is always left over for future use. Not an infinite amount, but utilization of wind or solar doesn't decrease the amount that's left to use in the future. With stock renewables, if our rate of use of these resources per time period is greater than their rate of renewal, if we cut down the trees faster than we're replanting them, um, then these resources too, like exhaustible resources, um, uh, can be completely uh, used up. And so just because a resource is renewable doesn't mean we can use however much we want per time period and there always will be enough. So I've kind of whittled my version of the sustainability rules uh, and you know, you can find some different versions out there. They more or less all contain the same basic uh, several rules. Uh, I've whittled mine down to about five, uh, but um, this, the economy must satisfy these to be sustainable in the long run. It, there's, there's not a question about this. So, given that we have these two sets of problems, the macro problems, the economic problems, and the environmental problems, are full employment and environmental sustainability incompatible goals? It sounds like we are back to the old 
jobs versus the environment, owls versus loggers, or, um, you know, that we can only have one or the other, uh, but that we would not be able uh, to have both. And even though I have always encouraged my students and others to, um, to look at the issues from the perspective of not jobs versus the environment, but jobs and the environment, there is a sense in which these two sets of issues are kind of working in opposite directions, and so are uh, many of the policies and approaches that we have uh, to deal with these seem to be, in other words, um, I argue that conventional macroeconomic uh, policies are unlikely to be effective, but even if they were, they would probably exacerbate our environmental problems. And if conventional uh, mainstream environmental policies were successful, that they probably would also exacerbate our economic problems. Yesterday in the discussion period, we were uh, talking about how, you know, we have to produce enough to feed and clothe humanity without destroying the earth and ourselves. And so in some ways, um, the provisioning challenge uh, is one where there's a minimal amount of productive activity that needs to take place in order to that every human being and human family and community uh, can have uh, their basic needs met. Um, and the environmental challenges kind of set maximums in terms of the amount of productive activity that uh, the uh, earth and its resources now, of course, there's also very important qualitative issues, but there is also this kind of uh, first approximation quantitative uh, tension between the two problems, the two challenges. So it does appear as though um, the two goals are not easily satisfied at the same time. So when we are considering solving the unemployment problem, we need to recognize a couple of the different general sources of involuntary unemployment in capitalist economies, and also uh, another very important point about the uh, nature of unemployment in a capitalist economy. So the two broad um, areas of um, causes of, of unemployment, uh, I, you could call Keynesian on the one hand, unemployment due to a lack of adequate, effective demand, and structural or technological unemployment. Now, my conception of structural technological unemployment um, is different than the, uh, what they <coughs> sometimes call structural unemployment in the mainstream, although it might have some, some points of contact and basically this is just the uh, difficulty of attaining and maintaining 
full employment in the face of ongoing structural and technological change. The capitalist economic system is dynamic, and so uh, especially with a fast-paced technological uh, change, uh, there are firms that are uh, new, there are others that are going under. There are industries that, new industries that are emerging, and <coughs> old industries uh, that are uh, no longer part of the economy. There are occupations and skills that are new, and there are others that are becoming obsolete. And so all of these changes regard uh, not just the aggregate proportionality and balance of the system, which would be the effective demand side, uh, but the intersectoral relationships, the inter-industry linkages uh, that are so important in the capitalist economy. So, you know, uh, the economy doesn't only require some kind of aggregate uh, balance, but also some type of sectoral uh, proportionality and balance as well. And then the other issue that we must recognize uh, when crafting an unemployment policy is the functionality of unemployment uh, in the capitalist economy. This is something that Keynes actually, to my knowledge, did not, uh, was not aware of, uh, or uh, did not see as so much of an issue. That is, Keynes differed from neoclassical economics in that he saw involuntary unemployment as normal in a capitalist economy. The, the economy did not have any built-in tendency to full employment for Keynes. But he saw unemployment as irrational. And therefore, all we need to do is eliminate it, and then everything will be better. If unemployment as uh, uh, Keynes's um, uh, contemporary uh, Michael Kolex Koletsky uh, recognized, if unemployment is functional, and Marx also is probably most famous for this insight. In other words, that unemployment actually performs functions in the capitalist system. It serves a purpose holding down uh, wages, um, providing a pool of available labor uh, ready uh, to uh, be hired <coughs> as demand expands when the economy goes into <coughs> expansion, uh, and even unemployment disciplining the workforce, um, that workers are much um, more hesitant about making demands when there's a long line of people ready to take their job. When you have full employment, right, then uh, the economy loses those functions. At least it does if we try to stimulate the private sector and normal public sector toward something approaching full employment. It's probably not even possible anyway, but trying to pump up the private sector to anything near true full employment not only would destroy the environment uh, or worsen the environmental problems, um, but it would not deal with the loss of functionality uh, because uh, if we're doing it by means of sort of 
uh, pump priming, you know, generic Keynesian stimulus, uh, or you know, monetary and fiscal policies like that. So, just for a minute, I'm going to say a little bit because others will be speaking on the job guarantee and explaining, you know, how it addresses some of these things. But there are two main ways in which green jobs as part of a public service employment program. So my green jobs, in this sense, are all public sector jobs. Okay, they are not private sector jobs. Many people who are speaking about uh, green jobs are trying to see if we can create more green jobs. And more green jobs will emerge in the private sector. Uh, not enough to do anything like employ everybody who needs a job, but um, a public sector, you know, green jobs core, a green WPA, a green Marshall Plan, um, has a couple different ways that uh, can promote environmental sustainability. One is that, of course, um, the people who are performing the work can actually do things that protect the environment, improve the environment, enhance the environment. Here's just you know some examples of recycling and insulation, rooftop gardening, urban landscaping. Uh, I, I see a real um, uh, wonderful uh, area in the emergence of urban agriculture and um, and that also of course is you know enhancing the environment giving young people something they have a passion about and even unskilled labor can assist in a lot of the tasks that are involved in monitoring enforcement education and research supports so many many things to do right but also, even if these public sector jobs are not um, assigned to performing a task that is explicitly enhancing the environment or cleaning up the environment, an economy that increases job creation and approaches full employment through this kind of a program can be more sustainable than if we tried to stimulate the private sector uh, to do the same thing because public sector activities should not be judged by the same criteria that we judge private sector activities, efficiency criteria. It always gets my goat when I hear people talking about a public sector activity. Public sector activities are not for profit, and so they should not be efficient in the sense of a private market. That's not the goal of a public sector activity, right? Instead, the criteria, of course, they should be cost effective, but the, the activities can be designed and judged according to different criteria, broader macro, social, or environmental goals. And uh, private firms are compelled by market competition to use technologies that may not be good for the environment uh, or uh, to use uh, conditions of production that use more scarce natural resources and so on and so forth. But public sector activities can be designed to pollute less, to use fewer exhaustible resources and so even if these activities are not performing an explicit environmental service, they will still be 
more sustainable. For example, we can have many job guarantee activities that are almost pure services and so uh, are not increasing the uh, pace of environmental uh, problems. And then the last point um, is this integrating of functional finance approach to budgetary policy and ecological tax reform. And so just quickly on areas where these two approaches find commonality, um, both think tax bads, not goods, is what we should be doing. We do the opposite. We tax things we want to encourage, income, innovation, uh, employment, and we don't tax or don't tax enough pollution and resource depletion and so on. And then uh, money as accounting information on the one hand versus <coughs> real resources that are subject to the laws of physics on the other. So this distinction is recognized by both approaches. So, um, you know, you can run out of real resources, but you can't run out of accounting information. And some really otherwise smart people can't seem to understand this, right? Uh, Al Gore, you know, I mean, he um, invented the internet, but he <laughs> cannot understand that if you put green pieces of paper in a box and bury them and dig them up in 75 years and you haven't created the food and clothing that the population in 75 years needs, the green pieces of papers will do nothing for you. And on the other hand, if you are able to create uh, the goods and services that the population uh, requires, the money is never going to be a problem, okay? Uh, so, uh, deficits can be too big, but they can also be too small. And so the idea would be to bring in the modern money perspective and functional finance that Randy was talking about last night and that others will talk about uh, for the rest of today and integrate that with ecological tax reform, the use of taxes, subsidies, and so on to try to guide the economy toward a transition to sustainability, but to do so without sacrificing meeting basic human needs through employment opportunities, and those are not only material needs, but also the psychological and emotional needs that are associated with having the opportunity to hold a job um, at the same time. Thank you very much. excited to be here. I think it's very important that the uh, modern monetary theorists are speaking with the uh, more sustainable, regenerative uh, economist orientation. I think it's a very powerful um, union that's happening here. And I'd hope that it would happen in my lifetime. And it's happening. And it has to happen. I don't see any other way forward at this point. Uh, I want to talk about building regenerative economies using parallel or complementary <laughs> currencies, alternative financing instruments. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, the TAN plan 
tax anticipation notes an approach, an instrument that I um, cobbled together for the situation in Greece, presented in Athens in November 2013 at the Levy Institute Conference. And some form of it seemed to have been um, being skunk worked in Athens, but they didn't want to talk about it, and the finance minister almost got accused of treason for <laughs> looking into this possibility. But it's a very powerful um, tool, I think, that we will find uh, is a very useful way of um, slipping past the neoliberal stranglehold on finance and rededicating the state towards public infrastructure that builds the green economy that we all want to live in and that we know uh, is the only way forward for us as a species. So we're facing a huge challenge now in what Joanna Macy calls the great turning. Uh, there's several different elements to it. One of the main ones is that uh, late capitalism is showing that its growth strategies have pretty much been exhausted. We're seeing productivity growth slowing down around the world. We have demog demographic uh, waves turning against the supply side of growth. Mainstream economists will tell you um, workforce, labor force growth rate plus labor productivity growth rate is what determines your speed limit for the economy. Well, the speed limit appears to be falling below two, maybe even below one in some cases, not just in the developed markets, but also in the emerging markets. In the emerging markets, we've had a decade or two of overinvestment, uh, investment booms, often in real estate, not exactly a productive asset in terms of creating future uh, products or future income flows, and malinvestment. We've had uh, different sectors, particularly in China, where uh, too much capital has been dedicated to production and flooding of tradable goods uh, has occurred, so we have tradable goods price deflation occurring. In the developed markets, we have uh, an Ouroboros machine where the snake is chasing its tail and catching its tail. In my lifetime, maximizing shareholder value has become the main um, imperative the dictate of corporate management. And what does that actually mean? If we translate that into plain English, when we're maximizing <coughs> shareholder value, CEOs and CFOs are issuing debt. They're issuing debt to repurchase shares, to artificially drive up the price of the shares that they get partially compensated for in their options. Surprise, surprise, the incentive structures are a little screwy here. And um, they're doing it uh, while not reinvesting the profits that they have into tangible capital stock that will create future income streams. So this is a setup for a major Minsky moment in my mind when you use debt and you don't put in place a productive asset that will create income flows in the future that will service that debt, eventually you come to a screeching halt. Um, but in the meantime, we're getting underinvestment uh, in the developed markets uh, at a time when we know uh, we need to do massive green infrastructure. We've got ecosystem decay. We've depleted natural capital stocks. It's all off the books. Uh, UN recently did a study. They found out if you looked at the uh, cost that companies externalize and you tried to account somewhat for this natural capital depreciation, depletion, it adds up to about the same share of GDP as uh, US corporate profits, which means capitalism is not profitable. <laughs> but we don't do that kind of accounting. We allow companies to externalize costs. We allow natural capital stock to be depleted without anybody having to show it on any kind of books. Uh, amazing how we do this. And we've got a private sector which because of this maximized shareholder value dictate in the ultra short run, they don't add that to the phrase, but that's what it's all about. Next quarter's earnings, next quarter's stock price. Private finance is too myopic to engage in many of the green infrastructure, uh, long payback period types of projects that we need to be doing. And public finance is ideologically constrained. Balanced budgets or limits to fiscal uh, deficits are uh, the ideological fashion of the day. Even Bernie Sanders, who has an MMT-inspired economic advisor, needs to be turned. I'm running a campaign called Turn the Burn so that we can get him to understand when he goes on CNN and they say, oh, Bernie, those are wonderful ideas, but how are you going to pay for it? He says, well, the government creates the money that you need to get in your hands to pay taxes and to buy bonds. So there is no financial constraint. And here is Chairman Greenspan on videotape telling you that in front of Congress. And here is Chairman Bernanke 
telling you the same thing in front of Congress. They're under oath, by the way, when they're telling you these things. And we can go back through statements of uh, Federal Reserve Chairman, or New there's a New York Fed uh, president from the 1940s, Rumble, Bernard Rumble, who makes it very clear, taxes are obsolete. That's the name of his article. So we knew this stuff, but we kind of conveniently forgot it right around the Reagan era. And then finally, uh, there's, as I uh, was alluding to before, there's this illusion that there's no money left. We have no money left to build a regenerative economy. Social Security is going to eat it all up. And Medicare is going to eat it all up. This is a really bizarre statement, because when we look at what central banks have done, and this is the total assets of the Federal Reserve in red, going from $1 trillion in 2008 to over $4.4 trillion more recently, there was no absence of money when it came time to subsidize bondholders, the 1% who own government bonds, which are what the, treasure, which, what the Federal Reserve is buying, marking up over the fair market, free market price, subsidizing the capital gains of the 1%. We're willing to do that kind of spending, and we have limitless amounts of money. I could show you the same balance sheet for the BOJ, for the Bank of England, for the ECB, which supposedly only has one mandate to preserve a low inflation target. Uh, so on and so forth. There is no shortage of money when it comes to subsidizing the 1%, but building a green economy, we don't have the funds for that. We can't do that. So we have to blast through this uh, cult. It's a cult. We've been brainwashed to believe that there's no money left for such things. How are we going to do that? I think we can do it through creating alternative financing instruments like the TAN proposal and using complementary currencies in a wise way. So we're going to try and Take a line from Jim Morrison. We're going to break on through the other side. That's part of what we're doing here. We're going to meld the best of complementary currencies with MMT insights. There's something like 80 complementary currencies inside the Eurozone alone today. Um, but they don't get widespread adoption beyond the mutual credit networks or the social affinity groups that they're circulating amongst because they're not acceptable as payment for tax liabilities. There was one, the Wurgel in Austria, in 1932, uh, which was acceptable as tax payment, and it was used to do tree planting and road building and so forth locally. 200 towns were about to adopt it across Austria. The Austrian Central Bank said, nine, no, can't do that. That's not legal. So when we combine MMT insights with complementary parallel currencies, of which there are many, Bernard Litter has a whole book about them, you can catalog these things eight ways to hell back again. It's amazing the ingenuity that people have brought to the construction and creation and allocation of money for various social purposes uh, when we take it out of the normal state-based or bank-based issue. So uh, what I'm going to propose here is that we do an end run around the neoliberal stranglehold and we begin issuing alternative public financing instruments like this tax anticipation note, which I'll describe in a moment. Uh, and different kinds of parallel currencies to bypass this artificial fib, this lie that we have a scarcity of money and that's what's holding us back. There's a financial constraint. It's self-imposed. And we'll do this while at the same force, at the same time as Matt was alluding to before, training the labor force for the next economy, for a sustainable full employment economy to exist. We need the people with the skills in place we know there's a lot of hidden unemployment. The labor force participation rate is ridiculously low in this country. As you get uh, more people retiring, uh, you're going to need either higher productivity or higher income streams of the existing workforce in order to, uh, to uh, carry the rest of the load. So uh, this serves many different purposes. I'm going to show you two different applications, one in Greece, and another one I want to adapt at more the state or um, um, county level for financing uh, uh, water rationing, uh, water scar scarcity response in California. So let me talk just very briefly about Greece. It's a uh, clear example, and now we've run this experiment in many countries across the Eurozone of the failure of, of neoliberalism. Greece had a problem not with fiscal deficit spending. That wasn't what got out of control in the, in the 2000s. They had a chronic current account deficit that kept getting wider and wider and wider because their households and businesses were spending more money than they were earning, and they were spending a lot of that money on imported goods. Um, when we hit the global financial crisis in 2008, 
these households and firms went to a net savings position. They wanted to save money. They wanted to spend less than they were earning and pay down the debt loads that they had built up over the prior decade. Debt that was issued in many cases by German and other core European banks because what were they doing? They were running chronic current account surpluses and increasing their claims on uh, other countries along the way. And so uh, it was two sides of the same coin. The solution in Greece that was imposed politically was fiscal austerity, but the problem wasn't fiscal irresponsibility to begin with. In fact, uh, Spain, I think, was running a fiscal surplus for much of the 2000s. So there was an incorrect diagnosis. It was an ideological diagnosis. It was a decision to shrink the size of the state in these economies. Uh, and Greece, like the rest of the members of the Eurozone, has minimal monetary policy influence. We have a one-size-fits-all monetary policy. So they had no fiscal room to maneuver. They had minimal monetary policy room to maneuver. It was all, remember, ECB is supposed to be doing one thing, keeping inflation below 2% by one single measure of it. They had no foreign exchange policy because basically the European Monetary Union combined all of these currencies into one. Think of it as a fixed exchange rate to the euro at the point of unification. So there's a fixed nominal foreign exchange rate. And you can depreciate your currency on a real basis if you're willing to grind down your wages and your prices by running your economy with huge slack, huge unemployment, uh, very low capitalization rates. Uh, so domestic price and income deflation becomes the only route out for Greece. And that, from the perspective of the core European nations, is the honorable way to do this. Cut the wages, cut the prices. You're all good with the current account. You're off to the races. You're much more efficient. Um, and hey, if you have a high private debt load, you're in deflation. And you have a Great Depression on your hands. And it doesn't go away for years. And you have a lost generation and a failed nation state. Brilliant. This is the brilliance of neoliberal economics. And they've stuck to it year after year after year, even though in country after country we've demonstrated that this ideology, this faith-based economics, is a hoax. It's an utter failure, unless it's serving another agenda, which I don't need to speculate on here. Uh, in 2010, I tried to capture Wynne Godley's approach to financial balances in the overall economy using what I call the Godley map or the macrofinancial balance map, and uh, just to sort of help you understand uh, the Greek problem, the vertical axis here is the fiscal balance, fiscal surplus to the north, fiscal deficit to the south. The uh, horizontal axis is the current account balance as a share of GDP, and uh, to the east we have a current account surplus, uh, selling more exports than you're importing. To the west you have a current account deficit. Uh, you can see from 2000 to 2007, the um, fiscal deficit in Greece is between 5 and 7 percent. What happens to the current account over that period? It balloons from 7 percent out to 14 percent of GDP. Now the sector balances of each part of the economy have to net some to zero in any uh, accounting period. When we get to 2007, we're running a 14% of GDP current account deficit in Greece, huge imports relative to exports, and we're running a 7% of GDP fiscal deficit. The difference between those two means the private sector is spending more than it's earning to the tune of 7% of GDP. That's pretty big, and if you keep doing that year after year, your private debt to income ratios surge and your financial fragility surges, and your ability to withstand income and price deflation in your private sector becomes minimal. Uh, you are setting yourself up for a Great Depression if you do that. We can see what happened with the fiscal austerity, uh, but it doesn't really work until we get into 2012, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, but it does work to collapse the current account deficit because what happens to the the imports when domestic demand collapses, you don't, you don't buy as many uh, imported goods when you don't have the income streams to pay for it. Uh, so what we had was the private sector going from a huge 
net deficit spending boom in the 2000s, fueled by German banks to a great extent. And when the global financial crisis hits in 2008, they say, well, no, we're done. We're not going to spend as much. And they shift to a major net savings position. And as they do that, the current account balance uh, adjusts. The fiscal balance doesn't adjust so well, uh, at least initially, because tax revenues are falling as incomes fall. And government expenditures going up as unemployment rates go up. Fiscal balance is partly endogenous to economic activity. Uh, the Austerians don't seem to get this. But there it is, right there on the snail trail. So um, what we've got now is deficit terrorism. And Greece has ushered in the rise of Golden Dawn. It's a fascist party. The Germans are replaying, basically, the Brüning scenario in 1930, 1931. He imposed austerity on Germany. What'd you get? Adolf Hitler. It wasn't the Beer Hall Putsch. It was Brüning's austerity. So we're repeating history here in a very, very malevolent way. Um, you get into this doom loop with this stuff. When you try to put an economy into a cold bath, deflation to get it to grow again. Expansionary fiscal con consolidation was the buzzword. That didn't work. Internal devaluation was the buzzword. That didn't work. Those are all code words for income and price deflation for smashing households and firms' cash flows. Okay? Uh, what did we get? As I showed you, they couldn't get the public deficit to GDP ratio down because the tax revenues would come up short, the expenditures would be above plan as the unemployment rate went up. And what would happen? The uh, EC would come in and say, you must follow the rules. You did not make the rule 3% GDP. So more tax cuts, more expenditure, more tax hikes, more expenditure cuts. Wash, rinse, repeat. You're caught in this doom loop. They can't see this. You can't get out of this thing. And you get, in the end, a failed nation state. Okay, That's what we're headed toward in Greece, probably in Spain too, maybe Italy as well. Is that what the EMU was created for? I hope not. But that's the result that we're getting when neoliberal economics is running amok. And it's really a faith-based economics. So how do we break out of this? Uh, we're going to do an end run. Uh, and again, I, I proposed this in Athens in November 2013. Uh, we're going to create a government liability called the tax anticipation note. It's a zero interest coupon bond, meaning it pays out no interest rate. It's a perpetual bond. It never gets called back in. It is in existence for perpetuity. Britain had these. They were called consoles. It's a transferable bearer bond. You can give it to somebody else. Your name isn't on it. And you're the only person that can use it. And uh, we're going to set it up as secured, encrypted electronic credits to bank accounts of recipients of the, these TAN issuances. This is a TAN. This is a TAN. It is zero interest rate paid to you. It's perpetual. It's transferable. So we can see a way of creating a government liability, a government financing instrument. That's essentially money. It can be used as money. It can be used as a final means of settlement in private transactions. Um, we're going to electronically issue these TANs to pay government employees and domestic suppliers to governments in green infrastructure projects in Greece. The government, in turn, is accepting these TANs at par. One TAN equals one euro as payment for taxes. That's how we maintain the value of the TANs. If the TAN trades, uh, at a depreciated rate relative to the euro, what's going to happen? Anyone with a tax liability is going to go bid for TANs in the marketplace and deliver them to the Greek treasury as payment for taxes. So you have an automatic self-regulating mechanism to keep this one TAN equal one euro exchange rate, internal exchange rate, essentially fixed. Uh, and you're going to allow consenting adults to buy and sell TANs as they wish. There would be private exchanges that would occur. And because it's a complementary currency dressed up as a bond, uh, but acceptable as payment for taxes, uh, we now have joined MMT with parallel currencies. And we have a good chance that this TAN unit would be used in private transactions. And in fact, there's things we could do to try to encourage that to happen. Uh, so we're creating an alternative financing unit that frees up fiscal policy, 
It creates a way of creating jobs and income flows inside the economy while restructuring the economy along uh, green uh, regenerative lines and also provides a stock of money flow, a stock of money to flow through the economy. Uh, so it serves many purposes. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but you can use Krugman's cross, which he referred to only once and never again, but got him very close to understanding Godly's financial balances. Um, uh, I'm going to jump over this actually, but basically the idea is when the private sector decides to net save, as they do after a global financial crisis occurs, the, the private sector um, sh curve shifts up and you end up, unless you shift fiscal policy to more stimulative position uh, with lower GDP. If you try to go to government uh, balanced budgets, you get even lower GDP. And in a highly privately indebted economy, that's the kiss of death. That's the almost insurance policy of getting you into the Great Depression. And ELR would create a vertical, an employer of last resort would create a vertical uh, fiscal balance schedule, and you could create it to target any nominal GDP level that you would require given the private sector net saving preference schedule. And I'm not going to go into this, but I can do that afterward with anybody that wants. So how could we apply this in the case of Greece uh, to have TAN finance green growth? We saw the problem is the current account. A large chunk of the current account deficit in Greece is energy related. So we could use TAN financed uh, ELR and green infrastructure projects and large scale solar panel install. Germany's got solar panels all over the place. Germany's a cloudy place. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a lot cloudier than Greece. So Greece could actually become a net exporter of solar energy to the rest of Europe. Never thought of that. Installs, we could install solar rooftop water heaters. We could have wind and wave energy farms. Greece has some shoreline, I'm told. It can be windy up there sometimes. We could do rooftop rainwater catchment programs. We could do gray water reuse programs. We could do community food forests. Many, many things we can do. Once you begin encountering these possibilities and you take away the financing constraint, the sky is the limit. And the potential will grab the political imagination of people who are being downtrodden by neoliberal faith-based austerian economies. Uh, so this also would free up euros for external use and for essential imports like pharmaceuticals. A lot of pharmaceuticals come into Greece and external debt service. Um, now let's take this from the nation state level down to a state level. We've got a huge drought problem in California. Um, can we apply TANS to drought remediation and wise water use? Governor Brown's going about it in four ways. One is to try to redirect more Colorado River water to California. Good luck with that. There's a couple other states that have the same interest. Uh, he's using rationing. That's a politically th a third rail. He's creating all kinds of enemies with that. Uh, he's replacing grass with astroturf all over the public spaces. And he's got his father's edifice complex. Pat Brown liked to build big, huge things, pour lots of concrete. And Jerry Brown wants to do hugely energy intensive uh, water desalinization plants. Uh, wrong way. We could do this another way. We could use an alternative. Uh, TAN financed California WPA and CCC projects, as Matt was uh, uh, recommending before. We could do laundry to lawn, gray water reuse. We could change lawns to food forests, sheet mulch them. I've done this. You get six volunteers. It takes you two, three hours to put cardboard down and compost down. In two, three months, you begin growing your own, you basically have your own supermarket in your front yard. Uh, gray water reuse and composting toilet subsidies, all kinds of ways we could use TAN financed uh, WPA CCC projects to do this. And here at this level, the TANs could be accepted either at the state level in payment for income taxes or at the county level for payment of property taxes. So you're creating a demand for these TANs. And this actually builds on a prior ex experiment within uh, California. They were using Scrip uh, for a moment or two there uh, when they had a budget deficit problem a couple years ago. And just last year, we legalized community currencies in California. So uh, there's, uh, there's room to believe that this could occur without having to create too much uh, trouble. We used to know how to do this. This is the Berkeley Rose Garden. It's a beautiful place. In the spring day, there's no better place to uh, just sit and realize you're happy to be alive. Beautiful view of the bay across. They built this in 1937 at the tail end of the Great who built it? The WPA. We once knew how to do this. We can do this again and we can use it to 
serve uh, the purposes of creating wiser water use within the state. Um, we can also use it to mainstream permaculture ideas. We lived by permaculture ideas for thousands of years as a human race, basically using uh, our understanding of how natural systems evolved and working with it, not working against it, enriching it, not depleting it. So uh, this is a way that we could sneak permaculture practices, and Bill Mitchell, one of the MMT bigwigs, is all over this. I just got my permaculture design certificate. I highly recommend it to all of you. You should know this is basic, like high school level education. We should all have this. The tribe once taught us this or else we didn't survive. So we can do this again. Um, and how do we get our hands around the possibilities here? In the US, we use about 100 gallons per day of water. In the UK, only 40. Well, part of that, a big part of that is the fact that we all want to believe we have French estates, so we have these lawns in front of our houses that serve virtually no purpose except we get to mow them every weekend, and we drop uh, 19 trillion gallons of water into them per year. It's insane. Uh, we can turn these into food forests for ourselves, for our neighbors, and cut that in half, at least. Drip irrigation, mulching, uh, all kinds of ways to do this. Uh, we have also in this country 900 billion gallon, almost a trillion gallons per year of untreated sewage uh, water flowing into the waterways because when it rains, the sewer systems back up and they have to let out the excess. And in each home, between 10 and 20 percent of the water use <laughs> is just leaks. Okay, so there's plenty of places where we can begin to make improvements here. Uh, gray water reuse, something as simple as taking the water from your washing machine and dropping it through a mulch basin and drip irrigating it into your lawn where you have fruit trees and so forth growing. That could save 10 to 20 gallons per person per day. That can be done in an afternoon. You can train teenagers, you can train long-term unemployment people to do that in an afternoon. Uh, this is something that's a no-brainer. And gray water is typically three quarters of indoor, indoor water use. So we're talking bathroom sinks, we're talking showers, we're talking baths, we're talking laundry machines. We can do rooftop rainwater catchment uh, projects. Uh, you get 1,000 gallons for each inch of rain on a 1,500-square-foot home. In Sebastopol, they get 36 inches. That's Northern California, 36 inches per, of rain per year. So you can basically take care of all your water needs on site. Uh, that uh, creates an interesting solution for the water infrastructure upgrade, which no municipality no county, no state is prepared to do, and nobody wants to talk about it, okay? There's one pipe coming into New York City that brings all the water into New York City. It's probably getting on to 90, 80 years old, I don't know. What happens when that pipe breaks? Uh, composting toilets, that's five to six gallons per flush. Why are we urinating and defecating into the water stream? We don't need to do that. Nitrogen and urine is great for the soil. You can make human manure out of uh, human shit and it can be used on uh, some crops. In fact, it's called night soil in China. They've been doing it for thousands of years. And uh, so there's all kinds of ways of approaching this once you start to think about it. Uh, re there's, so we can do this residential. I've worked with a variety of nonprofits. They're on the ground. They've been doing this for over a decade. They've shaken these systems down. Daily Axe is one in Petaluma. Permaculture Skills Center in Sebastopol is another one. Great Water Action in Oakland. They're doing this. They've been doing this. They are waiting and willing to train hundreds and thousands of people to do this. So if we had TAN financing, we could launch this tomorrow. They just want capacity. That's all they want. And this is uh, Trayton Heckman, that's his front yard. Uh, you know, nature is naturally abundant. The one instruction in all our DNA is life wants more life. You put an apple tree in your front yard and you have too many apples before too long. You have to give them away to your neighbor. So he's converted his whole front yard into a food forest. Now he knows his neighbors, the guy walking the dog, you give him an apple. He wants to know what's going on with your front yard. So you're reconnecting people with nature, you're reconnecting people with their neighbors, with community, and there's even, I've seen it in this neighborhood, a spiritual element to it. The gun-toting Republican with the, with the rack on his pickup truck is talking to the Obamanaut Prius driver about this stuff, and they're both excited about it, and it has nothing to do with the ideological divide that keeps us apart. So 
This can be done on a residential level, neighborhood by neighborhood. We could start in the poorest neighborhoods, and we could do this with a WPA CC, C, TAN finance project. We can do this at the commercial level in Seattle. There's something called the Bullet Center. Uh, living, it, they designed it to the living building challenge. It's a six-story, 50,000 square foot building. It's water and energy neutral. We could use TANS to subsidize some of this in government buildings. We could be building these buildings today. They have a 56,000 gallon rainwater tank on site. They do gray water filtering by plants using living machines, using ecological based systems, and they've got composting toilets. We could do this today on the commercial side. We just don't have money. We don't have the money to do that. And I, in my permaculture design project, we decided we're going to start reclaiming public parks. We're going to reoccupy public parks. We're going to regenerate the commons. And we're going to use these as places for education and also for food production. And so on the left is the way the park looks now, a bunch of soccer fields, picnic areas, bathroom, big, uh, <coughs> big parking lot. We're going to cover the parking lot with solar panels. We're going to run the rainwater off of that, that uh, solar panel system into a keyhole garden, community garden. Um, we're going to do all kinds of demonstration projects around gray water reuse in the bathroom, so on and so forth. We can recapture public parks, which we've assumed we just go for picnics or we go for the soccer game, turn them into community building uh, areas using TAN-based financing as part of the approach here. So it can be done on many different levels today. Uh, we know from our civil engineers that we've got a big problem with our sewer infrastructure. Dealing with the water issue, using TAN-based financing uh, is one way to handle that. Uh, we can, in permaculture, we talk about stacking functions. We can, while saving water, also save energy. About 20% of the total electricity and almost a third of the natural gas used in the state is used for water. So we can kill two birds with one stone. And there ought to be ways of being innovative about monetizing the future cost savings uh, while we go about redesigning water infrastructure along these lines. So in San Antonio, Texas, they have to spend $5,000 per, per acre foot of water to get new aquifer water rights. If they want to build a new dam and run pipelines, that's going to cost them $1,000 per acre. They can get the uh, same results cutting water usage, usage by over a third, almost 40%. Uh, just at $300 per square foot. That's where we can hit it. That's where we can do TAN-based financing. That's where we can do state and county-based WPA and CCC. This is all doable. We just have to break the stranglehold of neoliberal economics on our, our minds. So let's reclaim money. Let's compost the old economy. And let's build a new regenerative economy. It's doable. It's happening. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Um, while Scott is uh, setting up his uh, PowerPoint, um, I just wanted to say um, thank you for the presentation. I don't know about you guys, but I think we should have this man in the White House. <laughs> so uh, they leave me like three minutes? Is that right? No, five. Five, okay. Well, I only have 60 slides, so that should be easy. <laughs> Okay, so I need to be able to see that. Uh, well, I'm just going to jump into it since we're running low on time, and, and this might this might go quick, so we can get some some of it out of the way in Q and A, perhaps. Uh, anyway, well, let me, actually, let me go back. What I want to do is look at well, what the title says: how modern money tells us what it tells us about <coughs> economic sustainability. Um, you talking, we have plenty of time. No I can talk faster. <laughs> anyway, all right. We just don't have enough money. We don't have enough money. That's right. We have a time bank here. That's what we're doing. All right. Um, a number of folks have, uh, in my view, incorrectly suggested that modern money is great. But well, that part is a correct suggestion. Uh, the incorrect part of it is when they say, "But you, you haven't integrated." ecology. And as we've just seen in the previous two presentations, there's, there's quite a bit of consistency. Uh, my approach is complementary to the previous two. I was going to look at some of the central uh, tenets of modern money and tell, show us where we go with sustainability as a result. 
So first lesson, which you've heard quite a bit already, economies are not constrained by finance. So Randy was talking last night about the loanable funds model. Uh, loanable funds model assumes that we are constrained by finance. There is a supply of savings there, and there's no more. Right? That that's, that's all there is for us to, uh, to be loaned out and to be loaned to the government, et cetera. <coughs> But let's think for a second, where does the U.S. dollar come from, right? I, I remember uh, I teach in, in Iowa, and of course every year we get all the candidates coming to our school, and I remember back in 2008, Hillary Clinton was there, and she was so mad at the Bush administration for running these budget deficits, because now China had become our banker, right? Because, of, I don't know, China somehow prints dollars. I'm not quite sure how they figured that out, but... Um, does it come from Goldman Sachs? Well, of course, our, our Treasury Secretaries all come from Goldman Sachs. But, <laughs> um, anyway, this is, some of you guys might have uh, seen, this is Richard Murphy's blog. He uh, is an advisor, I don't know exactly his capacity, he's an advisor to um, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the new Labor Party leader. Uh, he had a conversation with a friend of ours, Stephanie Kelton. Uh, which he blogged about, and he says, during the email exchange, I guess it was an email exchange, um, when discussing the problem of explaining who pays for government investment, Stephanie said something which is, the problem is everybody thinks money grows on rich people. <coughs> I think that's one of the best statements. You guys didn't laugh, but we'll use that one again. Um, so where does money come from? Well, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis tells us where money, where the dollar comes from. As the sole manufacturer of dollars whose debt is denominated in dollars, the U.S. government can never become insolvent, unable to pay its bills. The sole manufacturer of dollars. Interesting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a schematic here uh, for understanding money and what basically has been talked about ever since uh, last night with Randy's presentation. Uh, this actually comes out of uh, a paper Matt and Warren Mosler wrote, what, what, 97, something like that, and it, it showed up also in Randy's book in 98. Uh, we can think of the government and central bank, uh, I've put them together for the moment just because it's simpler. Uh, when the government spends, it creates central bank reserves. Um, we, can all, we can trade those in for, for green paper stuff. But uh, when the government spends, sends a Social Security check, it creates central bank reserves by doing that. And it, uh, the, the bank then credits your account with a deposit. Okay. Now we can talk about um, bond issuance and so forth, but that doesn't change the central nature of what's going on. When we send taxes, as Randy said last night, we have our bank account debited or we borrow it from Citibank, I suppose, but um, by using our credit card. And then our bank debits our account and sends its own reserves back to the federal government's uh, account at the Treasury. Okay? We can call that state money or the state money approach. And that's essentially what um, Richard Murphy was talking about and, and so forth. Actually, Richard Murphy wasn't that. Stephanie. Um, that's not the only kind of money that gets created. Um, and I don't like the word money because all money is a liability of somebody. And so it's better to just say whose liability you're talking about. Um, but here's the Bank of England who tells us that the, what you guys learned about banking in your principles of economics textbooks was incorrect. Um, there is no fractional reserve system. Okay? We have... It, Reserve requirements do not constrain banks. Reserves do not constrain banks. Deposits do not constrain banks. Okay, as they say there in bold, whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's account, thereby creating new money. Rather than banks receiving deposits when households save and then lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. And Randy was talking about this last night. That it's the loanable funds model, the money multiplier model that you learned is incorrect. Banks just create money out of thin air. The process is not constrained by reserves. It's constrained by other things. Should be constrained by being able to find creditworthy borrowers. It's constrained to some degree by capital requirements of banks. 
Uh, it's constrained by the fact that some people may or may not want to borrow at the prevailing interest rate and those sorts of things. Could be constrained by regulators telling banks what they can and cannot do along the lines of what Randy talked about last night. And it should be. But they're not constrained by reserve requirements or reserves and so forth. And you can't make them constrained. There's a lot of folks on the left that are trying to find ways, 100% money and so forth, uh, to constrain banks. And in my opinion, none of those would work. In that way. Um, so what we can do is look at banks creating loans and deposits as sort of a horizontal expansion. Okay, And the reason why we do a horizontal expansion is because they're not creating net worth for the private sector. Whereas the government, when you receive a social security check or any sort of payment from the government, that is net worth going into the economy. Okay? And then when we pay back loans, it destroys those deposits. Okay? So we, we typically call that the horizontal type of money and the other one that I did earlier, the vertical. So we put them both together. Right? We have two different types of money. The point I want to make here is this process is not constrained. Okay? This, both of these types of money are created out of thin air. Okay? We, we do not have a financial constraint in our economy. Aggregate economies, economies in the aggregate are not financially constrained. What are they constrained by? Well, capacity utilization, productive capacity. So I got a graph here that shows capacity utilization, what, in uh, blue, and the CPI in red. It's not a perfect correlation because in fact, we don't allow our capacity utilization to get high enough to really create inflation most of the time. But there is some sort of positive relationship to it. And if you allowed it to get too high, you would see some inflation occurring. Um, what else are we constrained by? Well, as the previous presentations told us, we're constrained by ecological uh, constraints or capital or whatever the word is you like to use. So you may have heard about uh, the unburnable carbon movement or the, um, what's the I'm talking the assets one. What's the word I'm looking for with the stranded assets? Stranded assets that's the word, right? That uh, a significant percentage of the fossil fuel reserves that we see will never be will never be burnt because if they do, uh, we will go well over the two degrees Celsius increase limit that governments at some point are going to constrain themselves to. Um, and so at some point, these fossil fuel companies are going to have to write these off their balance sheet. So economies are not constrained by finance. They're constrained by productive capacity and ecological limits. We're going to move into that one a bit more in a second. One thing that I find interesting, this is a paper that Citi put out just a month ago. And it's pretty good. And it's kind of a big deal because Citibank is saying this. It's saying, you know, sustainability is a big deal. Uh, climate change is a big deal. We need to be doing something about it. But this is the typical thing you see in this literature that's attempting to influence policy, which is they measure the costs of climate change in money terms. So we measure the costs of ecological damage in terms of something that has no constraint. Isn't that kind of weird? If we need $44 trillion in 100 years, we can create $44 trillion, right? Might not be advisable, but it's not the constraint that we have that we should be worrying about. Full employment is a policy choice. I've been talking about the, this morning a bit. Some of you may have seen this a little less than a month ago. Warren Buffett, poverty in the U.S. makes no sense. You, shouldn't, you really shouldn't have an economy with over $50,000 in GDP per person and have lots of people living in poverty who are willing to work. Maybe Warren would like to give up some of his excess over $50,000 uh, to make sure that happens. But uh, he doesn't need to because, of course, we don't have a financial constraint at the end. Um, think about that, though. 50, a family of four, we have enough GDP in this country for a family of four to have $200,000 worth of goods and services on average. Um, so why do we have poverty? Well, this is something I like to bring up a lot. The Fed still does this. They don't say it the same way. So I pull out the one from 1999. But look at the underlying stuff at the bottom. The Fed had raised interest rates at that time. Why did they raise interest rates? Because the pool of available workers willing to take jobs. What's another word for that? <coughs> unemployed people. Unemployed people who are involuntarily unemployed, right? 
that pool has been drawn down further in recent months, and that's a trend that has to be contained if inflationary imbalances are to remain in check and economic expansion continue. Right? So we have as a policy rule that 10 to 20 million people need to be involuntarily unemployed, meaning they are looking for work and they can't find it. We're not even including the people who've stopped looking or who are underemployed and so forth. So full employment is a policy choice. But then at the micro level, who do we blame unemployment on? <laughs> right? We blame it on the people who are unemployed. What do we do about it at the fiscal policy level? Right? Well, Obama thinks money grows on rich people, apparently. Right? So, well, there was something else I was going to say there, but I Okay, so we can answer Warren Buffett's question of why, why it's happening. It's a policy choice. We are choosing to have poverty in this country. We are choosing to have involuntary unemployment. It is a choice that we are making. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, Matt was talking about, with the, with the green jobs and so forth, uh, how irritated you get when people say, well, it won't be efficient and so forth, it won't be, and that we shouldn't measure the efficiency of the public sector uh, relative to the efficiency of the private sector, which is of course true. The way I like to say it when faced with that one is, well, you've got the wrong opportunity cost of unemployment, okay? When you say public sector employment versus private sector, un, uh, private sector employment, you're not doing likes against likes. The opportunity cost of private sector unemployment, sorry, the opportunity cost of public sector unemployment is private sector unemployment. How efficient is unemployment? How efficient do you have to be to, 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 to cross that hurdle of private sector unemployment? And in addition to that, all the other costs that come with unemployment, right? Prisons, more police, right? More social workers, more divorces, more health care, all these sorts of things, right? pretty low bar for a job guarantee to cross, actually. In fact, it could be inefficient and still probably cross that bar. We don't have the money. Yeah, we don't have the money. Right. You mean to go back? Anyway. So what do we do, right? We say, we need jobs, so we need the Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> right? We need the 150 jobs that's going to create, or whatever it is, right, for two years. I'm exaggerating, I think, maybe not. Yeah, so, but that's how ridiculous it is when we choose to create unemployment in the economy. Well, the other thing that we do is we subject all of our regulations about the environment um, and all of our policies about the environment and so forth to cost-benefit analysis. Now, nobody's against measuring costs and benefits, right, and evaluating those things. But cost-benefit analysis is a particular method of doing things, of monetizing everything. Again, in terms of something that we, that has no limit, of course. Um, and one of the things that's always interesting is, uh, who was it, Matt or, or Rob, talking about um, how we, uh, subsidized the 1% after uh, the, the Great Recession, Can't remember, QE and so forth, subsidizing the 1%. How come you never had cost-benefit analysis of subsidizing the 1% no. with QE? <laughs> they were never subjected to cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> Graham Leach Bliley was never subjected to cost-benefit analysis. Every government regulation is supposed to be. So am I wrong or are you being I'm going to look that up. I'm assuming. Yeah. I don't know. What's that? The problem is that Grand Leach Bliley is a statute, and CBA only applies to regulations that are There you go. See, I knew I was right. <laughs> All right. Um, there we go. That's right. Um, so, but the other thing is look at this stuff electric utilities, industrial point sources, on road vehicles and fuels. Are these macroeconomic costs? When a utility has to spend, is that a macroeconomic cost or is that income for somebody else in the economy? 
It may be a cost, maybe we're misallocating. But that's not the way to measure it, right? What about the benefits? Well, thankfully, the Clean Air Act appears to have been about $12 billion of net present value. So we got it. But it's a good thing that we put a high enough dollar value on those people that didn't die, or it might not have been. So this comes down to our values and our priorities. And if we're going to monetize things, all we're doing is standing behind some arbitrary methodology for putting a value on things and a, a, a pretending that we've been value free. So it's about priorities and full employment. It's not about dollars. We can create full employment. If the electric utilities have to lay workers off because of the cost of the Clean Air Act, we can find things for them to do if we, have a, if we choose full employment. So a lot of what goes on in ecological policy is related to the horse and buggy versus automobile problem. We are on the road transitioning to a sustainable economy. Imagine if the move to, from horse and buggies to uh, automobiles was subjected to cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> right? Imagine if the horse and buggy industry had been subsidized like the fossil fuel industry. And then you would use the actual, actual market prices of the time, including that subsidization, to evaluate the costs and benefits. Because okay. cost-benefit analysis is biased towards the status quo of market prices. OK, lesson three, future generations will not be financially constrained. So Congressional Budget Office, CBO, just put out their analysis of what they think is going to happen to the national debt to GDP ratio over the next 25 years. Thankfully, I didn't see that they've been doing 75-year projections because those were so bad that now they thought, well, maybe we'll just do 25. Um, I don't know. They might be able to do two or three. That might be where they get right. I've seen at least the last five to ten years, they, well, five years, they've gotten pretty accurate at forecasting the deficit four years ahead, four or five years ahead. Um, but, you know, these were the folks that in 1999, 2000, were forecasting we'd pay off the national debt by 2000. Right? And if you remember the, the, the equations that Randy was showing you and that Rob was showing you, that means you would, of course, destroy that much in private sector wealth at the same time, net wealth. Um, anyway, so there we are at about 74% of GDP, which is actually a very modest number, not that I really care. Um, but it's actually a very modest number, and about 10% of that or more is sitting at the Fed, too. So it's really about 64 for 65% of GDP that is sitting in the private investor's hands. It's projected to go up to about 100%, right? And if you've been paying attention, there, was some, there were some economists who wanted to argue about five or six years ago that 100% was a threshold. No, 90% was, th was a threshold. And their research turned out to be fraudulent because they had misentered a couple of Excel equations um, in their, doing their analysis. Uh, of course, the... It, what they were doing was wrong anyway. Um, there's, a, there's a guy, uh, I think he's in, he's in England somewhere, Matthew Sharp. Timothy yeah. Sharp, Matthew Sharp. Tim and Matt was sound a lot alike. Um, anyway, Matt, <laughs> Timothy Sharp uh, just did a dissertation. He has a chapter in there redoing that same analysis and showing if you separate sovereign currency issuers from non-sovereign currency issuers, there is now no threshold in the sovereign currency issues, which we already knew, but it's always nice to see ourselves validated. So, Okay, so if we look here, this is CBO's projections of what's going to happen. Uh, he's a Gonzaga research Oh, that's right, scholar. he is. He's a, he's a Gonzaga scholar. That's right. Okay, anyway. Uh, he does fantastic work, so you should look it up. Uh, uh, so this is CBO's extended baseline projections of what's going to happen to Social Security. Medicare, all these sorts of things that are driving this national debt projection. So the main thing that's going on there, there's other things here that I could talk about, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to hit here, is that if you add those two together, Social Security and Medicare, it's going to go from about 10% to 14% of GDP in the next 25 years. And that's a crisis, right? 4% right? of GDP is, is a crisis. We need, we need to worry about that. For some reason, nobody ever mentions that over the last 
70 years, we've gone from zero to 10, and we didn't fall in the ocean. But going from 10 to 14, uh, we will fall in the ocean. But again, CBO apparently thinks that money grows on rich people, right? They should know that, as the Fed says, the government is the sole manufacturer of dollars. Paul Ryan also thinks money grows on rich people. This is one all the MMT people will know very well. This is from like 2005 or something like that. He was asking Greenspan about private, private personal retirement accounts for Social Security, if that's going to uh, create solvency in the system, which is a whole different issue that I don't have time to get into. Greenspan says, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. So he knows money doesn't grow on rich people. Greenspan is so frustrating, because sometimes he says things that work so perfectly, and sometimes he says things that are so incredibly asinine. But <laughs> such is the internal, in, in, inherent uh, contradictions of somebody who follows Ayn Rand, for me. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, but Greenspan also shows that he understood what the constraint was. It's nice to have the cash, but it's got to be in the context of real resources being created at the time those benefits are paid. As Randy Ray said in one of my very favorite quotes of all time, we can't bury Winnebago's and dig them up again in 25 years when the baby boomers are retired. Right? In the future is when we need the productive capacity. We can't save today for them. We need to create the productive capacity. Okay. So you would think, if CBO is telling us this is a crisis, that it has all these negative impacts on GDP and inflation and so forth. So here's their projections of what's going to happen to inflation and GDP. Um, well, inflation is going to be 2%. That's horrible. The Fed would die to get inflation to 2% right now. They would love that, right? Real GDP, nominal GDP is going to grow 4.3, 4.2, 2.2, which everybody thinks is essentially a potential anyway. I think they're wrong, but that's different point. Unemployment is going to be 5.3%. It's going to be horrible. You're going to hate it. Okay. But there's always this but, right? We have to worry about the fact that if the government borrows more, it crowds out private investment. Right? It crowds out private investment because, again, money grows on rich people. Right? And so what we have to do is have some sort of mini austerity, right? These are the changes we need to taxes and spending as a percent of GDP. Uh, and if we wait, it's going to be even bigger, right? To get ourselves back to 74% of GDP debt or 38% of GDP debt, which was our apparent average over the last 50 years, as if that matters to anything. but. Um, because, of course, austerity worked so well in Greece at creating more investment spending and capacity. Okay. So, oh, that was just... Thing. So, again, though, in the future, we won't be constrained by money either, right? So, when we go to ecology, um, we, have the same, we have the same issue that we had before. Uh, here's Bill Nordhaus. Also projecting three degrees Celsius, we're going to lose one percent of GDP in the future. He's, his estimates are low because his, his model is is what they call weak sustainability, but um, still fairly significant costs. But again, these are in money terms, right? Um, we'd be much better off thinking about it this way. And this is from the City paper. Uh, we're going to have reduction in crop productivity. We're going to have reduction in water resources. We're going to have sea level rises, which affect coastal cities. There will not necessarily be a decline in GDP in the future, but our choice is spend money fixing these things in the future, create the money and spend it fixing these things, or spend the money having a better standard of living in the future if you don't have to fix these things. That's the choice that we have. But future generations will not be financially constrained. It's just a matter of what are they going to have to do with that money. Lesson four, interest rate is a policy lever. So again, here's our loanable funds market, and that supply of loanable funds and demand for loan funds creates this equilibrium interest rate, and we love equilibrium, so that's the right interest rate, right? But that's not the way the world works. We already mentioned that this is the way the world works. We have two different types of money um, that we can look at, and neither of them are constrained. 
So if neither of those types of money are constrained, then how do we get interest rates? Well, the Fed tells us, New York Fed. <coughs> the costs of reserves, both intraday and overnight, are policy variables. Cost of reserves, by the way, federal funds rate that the Fed sets. Consequently, a market for reserves does not play the traditional role of information aggregation and price discovery. Wow. How many of you have taken microeconomics and looked at a market where there is no such thing as price discovery? <laughs> Bernanke just told us the same thing. Contrary to what sometimes seems to be alleged, the Fed cannot somehow withdraw and leave interest rates to be determined by the markets. It has no choice but to set the short-term interest rates somewhere. If you are the one creating the money, you are the one that necessarily is setting the terms that other people can get that money. So that's what's happening. And other interest rates in our economy are then based off of that one. Right? Treasury rates, longer term treasury rates, tend to move with expectations of that rate. Corporate bond rates and muni rates tend to be priced off of those. Okay? There is no natural interest rate in the economy that markets are setting. Markets are pricing off of a rate that is a price that is a policy variable. And the Fed, as we know, doesn't keep that interest rate somewhere forever, right? The Fed uh, tries to manage that interest rate relative to the state of the economy. It's a policy lever, it's not the policy objective. Right? But when we go to ecology, the policy lever is confused for the policy objective. Right? So if we look at the CBA, uh, wait, city stuff, those numbers are actually assuming a 0% discount rate. And they showed you what they would be if we use different discount rates. Right? Because these, the these are the costs and benefits into the future of climate change. So apparently if we used a 5 or 7% discount rate, there would be no cost to climate change. Mm -hmm. No financial cost. Financial cost. Well... There's that bullet that said extinction of species. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, we have two views on the natural interest rate, or the natural rate of discount, as I like to call it. The positivist view. This is Nordhaus. By the way, all these folks are Keynesians that I'm talking about here on the, on the natural, on the, the ecology and interest rate stuff. Discount rates should depend primarily on the actual market returns that can, societies can get on alternative investments. To use any other rate would be to misallocate scarce financial capital, right? because money grows on rich people. The other one is the ethicist view. This is really interesting because, well, I'll get, I'll get to this in a bit. So hopefully I'll say that, remember to say this is really interesting later. Um, they use a Ramsey model. Uh, returns to capital. If you've ever been in graduate school in your second semester macroeconomics PhD course, you probably know the Ramsey model, uh, where the interest rate is uh, decomposed into these three parts. Okay, I'm not going to get into these three parts, but basically, uh, one of the more famous uh, books on environmental economics and climate change is, is by S Nicholas Stern in 2006, now called the Stern Report. Actually, it was called the Stern Report in the book. He argued that the, excuse me, the real interest rate was about 1.4% that we should be using for discounting. He wanted a low interest rate, right, because uh, we need to give future generations a, a, a bigger value. And so market interest rates are too high. Okay. In fact, though, the, uh, the positivist view of market rates can also be broken down because they come from the same local funds theory. And so this is how Nordhaus breaks it down. He gets to 5.5, and that's how he breaks down the 5.5. Okay. So if we look here at a paper that was attempting to, a guide for the perplexed, explain this for everybody and sort of find this middle ground on this positive eth ethicist debate. This is like the monitors Keynesians and so forth in macroeconomics. Uh, Cass Sunstein, maybe you've heard of him. He was working for the Obama administration at a fairly high level and was, te uh, uh, was doing, uh, setting up the cost-benefit analysis there. It says it does not matter whether the current rate of interest are ethically correct because they still represent the opportunity cost of, ca of investment. Right? We have fixed financial resources, and so to not use a market rate essentially is unethical. Right? Uh, the problem with the ethicist approach is if the correct social discount rate is 1.4%, we should be saving vastly more than we do today to leave the ethically appropriate legacy for the future. So we should be saving more 
pushing out that supply savings, so the interest rate does fall to 1.4. That's what he's saying. So overall savings investment rates would dramatically increase, and then it would be ethically correct to use 1.4% discount rate. Okay, so I just want to show you this. Some of you may have seen this. The picture on both of these pictures, well, let's see. Picture on the left is of a street in Manhattan in 1900. What you see there, the interesting thing that you see there is there are no cars, only horses and buggies. The street on the right is also in Manhattan, 1920, 20 years later. What you see there, no horses and buggies, only cars. Right, 20 years. But if you use a 5, 6, 7% discount rate, 20 years from now is worth nothing. Right? So if you had done cost-benefit analysis on this, you would have said, no, we need to protect the horse and buggy industry. Right? So what we've done is we have, in, in, in ecological economics, environmental economics, we have sub, we've got policy, public policy backwards. And it's not surprising, because there's a long list of things economists don't understand. business financial statements, um, and interest rates, and public policy, right? Uh, and what they get wrong with public policy here is the interest rate is a policy lever. Policy levers are not the same as policy objectives or policy goals. The policy objective or goal comes down to our values about how much sustainability, how much climate change, et cetera, we're willing to tolerate, okay. and what trade-offs we want to incur. And of course, we can have full employment throughout that entire process. There is not an interest rate that you should be setting and saying, ha ha, I'm done. The Fed doesn't do that. The Fed doesn't say, the interest rate is 2%, we're done, let's go home forever. Right? Actually, we think they should, but that's a totally different story um, for different reasons. But So what does modern money tell us about the economics of sustainability? I'm sure I'm way over your five minutes, I'm sorry. Here we go. So we need to get people to own up to their, to what they're saying really means. Agreeing with one or more of the following makes you an enabler of poverty. We can't afford to end poverty. It's their own fault for being poor. We will burden future, future generations with debt. The markets will punish the government if we try and help the poor. All of those are false. If you believe one of those, you are an enabler of poverty. A lot of the people that believe these things share our politics, the politics of those of us in the room. And they are at high levels of policy making, and they believe these things, and they're making policy based on these things. <coughs> and no matter how much they sound like they agree with you, they are enablers of, pol of power. Enablers of climate change denial. Again, a lot of them share our politics. They hide their analysis of the effects of climate change, biodiversity loss, and so forth behind costs or even benefits in money terms now or in the future. The micro-level trade-offs masquerading as macro-level costs and inapplicable time weights. So in the end, evaluating the impacts of climate change, biodiversity lost, and so forth, I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it, by the way, uh, are inescapably reduced to priorities and values, not money, not interest rates, etc about the extractive versus sustainable economy both now and in the future. And that's the way it should be, and that's what we should be focusing on. And anybody who wants to focus on this other stuff needs to be called out for being a climate denier enabler. Thank you. Uh, Scott and Rob, can you talk about which leaders, political, economic, or business, uh, are enablers of poverty or deniers of poverty? The climate change, you know, we can talk about later, but, but, but like who, can't we send this four question quiz to the head of the Fed 
the president. Can't we get people on the record? Have you heard of Congress? <laughs> Congress shall make no law. Um, yeah, the economics profession, Federal Reserve in some cases, sometimes they understand parts of it. Um, certainly I don't know too many, well, too many people in policy circles that understand it. Although I do hear from people who talk to people in policy circles that they do understand it, but they tell us they can't say it out loud. Okay, so uh, this is just the follow-up. This is for uh, Rob and, and Scott and Matt. Who are the allies? Who are the allies who are willing to be public about it? The allies are local. They're based in your neighborhood, in your town, in your county. Good luck with Congress. Good luck with Bernie. I hope he gets in, but you know what's going to happen when he does. <laughs> uh, you've got to start at the grassroots level and make it happen, demonstrate that it's possible. That's what I've been doing for the last five years, getting my hands in the dirt. I sit behind the computer, computer model most of my days, but when I get my hands in the dirt and I meet real people and we do real things together, things change. And that's extremely empowering. When we were doing this permaculture design project inside that park, we spent an afternoon laying out these plans. People were walking by, going, what are you up to? Oh, that sounds interesting. We want to be a part of that. And the ranger walked by. He said, oh, we're doing our planning process. Could you bring this to the planning process next month? That's how it happens. You've got to make it happen around you. These entities that are at higher levels, they're captured interests. We know who they're captured by. So we've got to do it at the community level. State level is probably as high as it gets, maybe bioregion. Take it from there. That's, uh, uh, yeah, that's true. At least for now, it's at the community level. And as you said, the horizontal vertical approach shows us how we can design complementary currencies to do a lot of these things in the first place. Um, and it is those conversations you have with people, it, and, and it frequently doesn't matter if they're on the left or the right. They, they, they will get it in many cases. In crisis situations, sometimes you can get at the national level, like with Greece, but there the politics were so screwy inside that party right. that I tried many times to get a conversation going with those people. They didn't want to have that conversation because they were doing it all in the back room. They didn't want anybody to know this was going on. At least that's Jamie Galbraith's take on it. I actually cornered Varoufakis in Paris in April at the INET conference and said, Giannis, get a tan. <laughs> and he didn't say a word. He knew exactly what I was talking about. Um, so it can be done in a crisis situation, but you've got to be able to galvanize people and you have to have leaders that are willing to really stick their neck out and uh, are willing to uh, make this extra parliamentary politics. That's what we talked about in the 70s, putting people out on the streets, making it happen at a community level. So if it's a fan, it's John Boehner. <laughs> right. Well, one of the things that's interesting is crisis situation. Whenever we have to go bomb somebody, we always remember we can create money. That's right. When 25% of the children live below the poverty line or 40 pe million people don't have health insurance, then we can't afford it. But we have to bomb somebody, hey, we print money. And we have collective amnesia after every major war that we have this capability. It's amazing. Uh, the economic literacy is, of course, important in terms of this stuff. But the political literacy, but partly the chime in on what you're saying, is incredibly low as well. Part of it has to do with the capture of the narratives. Yes. And if they don't have a substitute narrative, then they fall back onto these, um, how to say, homilies and so forth and lesser creations. Um, <laughs> just, I mean, at a local level, I haven't seen much yet that didn't turn into a Ponzi scheme of some sort. And this, the major takeaway is the wages that are put up. And this is nonprofit, community level, et cetera. So there's a massive issue there oh, yeah. in terms of, I mean, yes, showing them, getting their hands in the dirt is good. But there's other levels of it uh, where, how to say, things like audits yeah. you know, are important. Yeah. Thank you. As a non-economist, this question probably makes it obvious. But uh, uh, to uh, Robert and anybody else, the financial powers in the European Union and historically in the World Bank or in your National Monetary Fund must understand the results of austerity. They've been documented for hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of years. Why, what is their motivation in continuing to push that in the face of almost certain catastrophe in the, 
in the uh, entity that is being forced to undergo these austerity measures? It's a cult. We need religious deprogrammers. Uh, they believe in the free market. They believe prices adjust. If you allow prices to adjust, you will get to full employment. This is the essence of neoliberal theology. Uh, this came in as a reaction to the social experiments and economic experiments of the 1970s. It was a very conscious decision. That's why people like Matt and Randy were sent to Siberia in academic economics, because they had an alternative view. It actually corresponded to the real world much better than the mainstream view, but it's a theology. And so uh, they will deny and deny. The recipe for Greece is cut more. Cut more spending, cut more public jobs, raise more taxes, go gather more taxes. They still don't get it. It's denial. Human mind has amazing capacity for denial. It served us well in some cases. We're all going to die. We don't want to face that. We'd be paralyzed if we thought about that every minute. But it can also create real problems. And this is the neoliberal faith. It is a faith-based economics. Markets will get you to full employment. Just get government out of the way. Let prices adjust. Well, one of the prices that needs to adjust is the interest rate, and that's set by the government. <laughs> so we've got a problem here. We need a culty programmer. My question is, um, in Ohio, the Ohio Constitution has all kinds of limits on how much state debt we can go into. And because an alternative currency, we're talking about a bond, a, a TAN, uh, so what, but wouldn't it be correct because it's perpetual zero coupon, we could say to the Ohio Treasurer's Office, no, you could mark this as equity. This it doesn't, this is technically, is legally, perpetual debt is not debt. Okay. It's basically right. equity and it does not get counted right. in public debt to income or public debt ratios. That was part of the reason for issuing it as a perpetual bond. Uh, by packaging it that way, we can go through all those ceilings and there's no problem. We have the financing. So you're absolutely right. And uh, again, this is basic finance. We should be able to talk about this, but because it's ideologically charged, we can't recognize the fact that a perpetual debt is not, a, it's not counted in the debt cal calculations. Alan, you're next. Thank you for your talk, all your talks, they were great. Um, I had the same question, but for California. You know, they did issue IOUs, but yeah. they wouldn't take them in the payment of taxes, exactly. and I'm not sure why that was. But it, where does it say that they can actually do this? It's not considered issuing um, currency, which states are not allowed to do? I've, I've got uh, several conversations going on with lawyers and municipal finance people, and they have yet to raise a red flag on all of this. I think it's a a fear that, okay, so we issued these IOUs and we're going to receive them back, and so how are we going to pay uh, outside suppliers, outside of state suppliers and so forth? They're not going to accept these IOUs. People in state have a reason for accepting them. They have to pay taxes that the state imposes on them. But outside of state? So how are we going to pay for those things? There's just a, there's two problems. There's, an, there's a, a failure to recognize that uh, the demand for money has something to do with taxation. We just don't think about it that way. And there's also a natural uh, conservative um, orientation of state treasurers and municipal uh, municipalities. This is an experiment. Actually, it's one that we've done many, many times if you look at the history of complementary currencies. But this is a hidden history. No one talks about this stuff. So. Well, they I could make a point about the law on that. Yeah. Article 1, Section 10, arguably is pretty clear that states aren't allowed to do this, but like a lot of laws, pretty early on, once that was set up, it was sort of got around, and there's a long history yes. of this being done. So whether or not you were going to challenge it on that constitutional basis, practically speaking, it hasn't been, and there's a long history of it being done. That's why if you issue it as a bond, not even, as a currency. Even, even the 19th century history of bonds were pretty clear that if it's accepted in payment of taxes, and we're, we're doing research now on the, 19th, the legal history there, that it is money, but nobody brought that constitutional challenge, right. and it's sort of, you know, if you tried now with that history, California's already done it. So right. if you try with that legal history, the court would probably work out some jujitsu. The, pro the problem is defining it as legal tender. This was also the case in the Greek 
the 10 that we were proposing. If you declare it as legal tender officially, you got a problem. But actually, the ECB gave its blessing to parallel currencies in Greece. And even Schäuble, Finance Minister Schäuble in Maine, is saying, well, maybe Greece needs an alternative currency to get by here. We'll put them on the side, and they can just fiddle with an alternative currency, and then they it's can come the, back in. It's called the drachma. The, the, challenge, here, <laughs> the challenge here, and I'll stop it, is, is that Article 1, Section 10 doesn't talk about money. It talks about bills of credit. Right, so, so we can... It's a, it's, and that, that has its own legal history and definition. Right. It's far closer to bonds and a much wider spectrum right. of monetary instruments. So, again, I think legally, you could definitely make the case the Constitution doesn't allow, but practically speaking, the legal history is that it's been allowed. Well. I can find a lawyer and pay them to say that it's legal. I'm sure we can do this. <laughs> that's the issue. And so who's going to take me to court? And when they do, that's a big political issue. Because if I've got 100 water rationing and water reuse wise policies going on in California, and some jackass conservative <laughs> is going to come after me and say that's legal tender, he's going to get hung. It's going to be a revolution. There are so. two lawyers in the room, you won't have it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I wanted to say, I'm, I'm really glad we're having this conversation because we can't really have this kind of uh, policy-oriented solutions without the legal scholars who have been working with us over the last few years. So thank you for being here, and thank you for, for all, all the work that you're doing with the MMT network. Um, I'll take one more question, and then we'll take a break. My question is for Rob. I was going to ask you if the EU will allow Greece to implement a TAN, but you might have already answered my yeah, question. Yeah, the ECB's legal department gave it its blessing. It said you could do this, and you would not be violating any of our directives. In fact, there's 80 complementary currencies, some of them in Germany, already in operation within the Eurozone. And even the Bundesbank has done a whole paper on these and said, this is OK. They can do this. Um, and as I said, Schäuble, who's the hard line, he is the face of austerity. He is the austerian, said, why don't you guys try this? So I think we got a lot of green lights on that. The problem was internally, Syriza was a mess. It wasn't really a party. It didn't really have a, a correct vision. And they tried to do this all behind closed doors. You could have done this out in front of everybody and built a popular movement behind it. And at the same time, educated all of Europe about what money really is and how it can be used. It could have been amazing. But no, they had to keep it a dirty little secret. Well, I guess the transnational capital that controls the ECB will never let that happen. Well, remember, ECB's legal department said, you can go ahead and do this. Well, because they knew it would work. Yeah. We can debate that. It's a hypothetical case. <laughs> well, please join me to thank the panelists for a
No, they've been bothering me. Me too. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yes, that great.
drop their tablet on the floor somewhere in that area. Is it yours? So if this is your tablet, uh, we found it on the floor in that area. Please come and claim it. Thank you. 
We're going to get started uh, in a few seconds, so if you could grab your coffee, water, and uh, join us uh, in the room. Also, once again, somebody dropped their tablet, uh, or we found it on the floor in that area. If this is yours, please come and uh, claim it. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming back. Um, so we have uh, the panel this afternoon, or this late morning, I guess, is, gosh, I just forgot, uh, Money, Finance, and Sustainable Prosperity. Uh, one thing I noticed was in our panel just before, Fadl said that uh, none of us needed introductions, and so we didn't get one. Um, <laughs> And I kind of thought that was cool because I'd gotten to the point in my career where I didn't need an introduction. So I'm trying to figure out which one flatters them more, to not give them an introduction or to give them introductions. So I, don't know. I guess we're running short on time, so we'll go with the no introduction because they, they don't need they don't. All right, so first paper is Pavlina Ternova. After 15 years, I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Uh, joblessness and Inequality by Design, Rethinking Public Policy. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is that okay? It feels loud a little bit. It's still a little loud, right? Okay. All right, thank you, thank you for having me, thank you for inviting me. And um, it occurred to me as uh, we've been discussing these various topics that outside of this venue, we normally talk about problems of the environment, the problems of unemployment, the problems of inequality, and um, as separate issues. Uh, we discuss them as these market failures. We discuss them as complex problems of a globalized world um, that have multiple causes and are um, somewhat formidable, somewhat intractable. But what we're doing here is we're uh, drawing the connections between these, the causes of these problems. We are um, attempting to present a holistic view of money, monetary economies, and the fallout um, that uh, market uh, forces have on the environment and the human impact. So what I will explore today is the connection between equality and unemployment. Uh, please take my 
uh, remarks in the context of what you have already heard about the ecolo uh, ecological limits. Could you turn her up a little bit, please? Okay, the ecological limits within which we operate. And my basic premise is that unemployment and inequality are really not um, exactly market phenomena. They are problems uh, created through policy design. They are um, policies that have uh, multiple causes, but they operate within certain policy space, within a monetary, op uh, monetary system where the rules are set um, by uh, public institutions, laws, and deliberate public policies. So I will begin with um, sort of our vision, like what do we prioritize here in this room? And then I will draw out the, the way conventional policy tends to think about uh, inequality and unemployment and why that thinking has failed. And it has done more than failed. It has reproduced, it has created conditions to reproduce unemployment and to exacerbate inequality. So I usually start you know, with the two outstanding faults uh, of the economic society that we've all read in John Maynard Keynes, but many economists in the political economy traditions have made this verdict, right? We have you know, unemployment and the arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth. And incomes are two main problems. And this is really an issue about our values, right? We are bringing them to the fore. Why do we have this economy? Who does it serve? And in what way do we want it to work? So we, we single out these two economic problems um, as ones that require special attention. The way I like, and I'm putting a question mark, because obviously um, we can't be talking about these problems if we destroy the environment. <laughs> What's the point of solving unemployment or income inequality if we don't, um, uh, if we uh, cannibalize our, our planet? Okay, so, um, these are two economic, uh, these are two outstanding faults, not just of economic policy, they're faults of, of economic society, they're faults of economic policy. And my argument will be that our failure to address and solve the first problem, uh, our failure to secure full employment actually helps contribute to the exacerbation of the second problem, inequality. So it is, uh, these are two problems by design. <coughs> All right, so unemployment. Unemployment in a modern market economy, in a capitalist economy, is what we call a monetary phenomenon. Again, we talk about unemployment as an abstraction, but behind unemployment there are some very simple basic things. When we talk about unemployment, we really are talking about people being able to participate in the economy, earn income, and contribute um, in one way or another to uh, the economic process. But from the point of view of firms, unemployment is a monetary phenomenon. From the point of view of firms, that quite simply means that it is not worth uh, the firm to hire an extra person. It, it is not profitable to employ more people than they already are employing. So, um, you know, in economics, we've got various models of the supply of labor and demand for labor, and then we use all sorts of um, price misallocation explanations of why we have unemployment. Um, and all of these are wrong. The problem of unemployment is really is that there are not enough, there's not enough hiring. The in the aggregate, employment is determined by how many firms are willing to hire depending on their profit expectations. So from the point of view of firms, that's what a monetary phenomenon means. It's just not profitable to hire the extra additional person. From the point of view of households, unemployment is a monetary phenomenon because somebody wants a wage earning opportunity and the opportunity is not there. So again, we talk about the inadequacy of skills, the um, you know, globalization, forces of globalization and that uh, in some ways unemployment is this market phenomenon that can't quite fully be uh, resolved. <coughs> but we also forget that um, unemployment is an explicit public sector policy. 
in uh, the way that our friend Warren likes to put it, is that unemployment is evidence that the currency has been restricted, right? The provision of currency has been restricted. And as a issuer, monopoly issuer of the currency, you have the responsibility to make currency available for those who seek it. Now here we've got to qualify this because um, how we provide the currency and how we actually um, fix the aggregate demand problem, the method by which we spend is crucially important. And this is the, the focus of my, uh, of my remarks. Unemployment is not a private sector failure. It's a public sector failure. Firms are simply not in the business of guaranteeing truthful employment. That's the nature of a market economy. And government can try to massage all of these factors like profit expectations and um, the savings rate, etc. Uh, the interest rate to create conditions so that the private sector creates full employment, but that is not their job, right? The private sector may secure full employment, but only as a fluke, as, a, as an accident. And this was the lesson that we got from John Maynard Keynes. And if, if the government sector is unable to create <coughs> conditions that will um, induce the private sector to permanently create full employment, it is the job of the public sector to do so, to create those conditions. So I see employment as an end um, in itself. <coughs> so we call unemployment a special problem. I want to talk a little bit about why it is special, why it is unlike anything else. It is persistent, it is perverse, it is pernicious. Of course, it's not a new problem. You know, most people are talking about unemployment now because we've just lived through the greatest financial crisis of our <laughs> lifetime for most of us. Um, but they ha there have been problems within in the labor market that have been there for quite some time, for decades. You know, we know that um, if you end up being unemployed, the chances of being in unemployment for longer periods of time have increased as the proportion of those who are unemployed. Um, who are in long-term unemployment has increased over time. So that's basically the secular trend that this chart is um, demonstrating. Now, of course, it has gotten much worse. Um, there has been a mass exodus from the uh, labor force uh, in the last uh, few years, since uh, 2008, and a unprecedented decline uh, in the employment to population ratio. So when I say it's persistent, uh, I mean that, uh, quite literally, we don't have um, <coughs> adequate number of jobs for everyone who wants a job. We have, um, so this chart shows you, you know, job openings, the red line of job openings, and the blue line of the unemployed, the jobs that are needed. And there is an ongoing, on ongoing basis, a gap between the number of jobs that are needed for all those who want them. So you can train and educate and improve the skill of the uh, labor force, but in the end, we will still be experiencing an, uh, a shortage in the aggregate if we have not provided uh, abundant uh, job opportunities. So it's a persistent problem. Um, it is perverse. I, I like to call this the mark of unemployment. You have to be unemployed. Um, carries with it a certain stigma and blocks future opportunities. Um, there is, um, you know, so in, in a way you can say that unemployment breeds unemployability, at least in the, in the eyes of the, of the private sector. There is um, there's some, um, well, anecdotal evidence, you've seen it all on monster.com, <laughs> where, you know, you say the unemployed did not apply, uh, which is precisely the problem we are trying to solve, right? The unemployed need to apply. Um, but the reason why you see this is because in the eyes of the employer, nine months of unemployment equates to four years off of work experience. So, you know, you imagine yourself an employer, you're looking at a bunch of resumes, and who do you hire first? You will hire the one with the job. Then you will hire maybe somebody who has been out of the labor force for a few months, and then it will be the other person who's been out of the labor force for a few months and you're gonna scratch your head and you're gonna wonder why have they be out of the labor force? What happened in between? What did they do? That would be the first thing you would wonder. And so you have this kind of perverse effect that the 
employed and employable actually win the game of, uh, in the job search. Right? And um, we see this um, by another research that indicates that almost 50% of firms who are hiring, of new firm hiring, is actually poaching. Right? You are raiding other firms for their employees. So we've got um, what is a seemingly uh, intractable problem that is also pernicious. And well, I mean, the first thing that we need to recognize is that we are already paying for unemployment. And uh, you know, there are direct costs. But in this uh, conference, we have been emphasizing that the direct costs are not really um, the ones we need to focus on. Yes, we are paying in the form of unemployment insurance. Then you can add up all the SNAP programs, the temporary assistance to needy families, etc., cetera, et cetera, in terms of do dollar value. But what we really need to be looking at is the human cost, the indirect costs um, that are expressed themselves in, in, in less social mobility, economic freedom, more instability in the economy, more financial crisis, depressed growth, um, eroding communities, health, enormous health uh, costs, um, uh, increase in suicides, um, underfunding of other programs um, like state pension funds and uh, social security, um, as well as social and political instability. So, I mean, there is just, it's, the, the research is enormous. Uh, it's just economists don't do that research. You know, what, are, what is the fallout of unemployment? Virtually every major socioeconomic problem is related to unemployment from child outcomes to family cohesion. We already listed a number of these um, earlier on. So, you know, this is a chart by a friend of ours, Bill Mitchell, who actually looked at the dollar value, the daily losses due to unemployment. And, you know, and he basically made the argument that because we have a policy of maintaining unemployment, not dealing with it, uh, every day, we forego about $10 billion uh, of GDP. That's it. Every day, it's, it's foregone growth and output. Um, and I like to think of this not in terms of the $10 billion number, but in terms of what stands behind the $10 billion number. That's $10 billion worth of um, fewer childcare. Uh, outfits, fewer programs, fewer uh, services for the retired, fewer environmental projects. Like that's what that 10 million, 10, 10 billion dollar means. Um, and so, why do I say that we have unemployment and inequality by design? Well, it's because that's what policy attempts to do. It is. It is. The first thing is that we have a commitment to a Nairu, and Nairu is this concept of natural unemployment, which basically says that no matter what you do, the economy will create only so many jobs. However much you stimulate the, the private sector, you're going to create only so many jobs. A number of people will be left unemployed. And if you attempt to move the economy beyond this barrier, you're just going to create a lot of inflation. So this is the most that you can do. So we already have very explicit commitment to maintaining unemployment. I think Matt was saying it, uh, or Scott was saying it earlier, that if we, um, I, uh, serious about inflation control, then we need to use this as an, an, a necessary evil. Right? So that is, that is our explicit commitment not to solve the joblessness problem. The second thing is that the way we think about solving the unemployment problem is that we think about it as a byproduct of all sorts of other things that we would do. So the way we design policy is to, um, to work directly on other channels that will then hopefully trickle down to the job list, that will hopefully produce the desired employment effect. So what do I mean by that? You know the conventional trickle down policy, right? We say, you know, tax policy is our primary direct tool of managing the economy. And the way uh, we do this is by reducing top marginal tax rates. Hopefully that creates incentives by the um, job creators, right? And uh, that creates a little more investment, that creates more growth, and growth then brings employment opportunities. So look at this, you know, the, how many steps you need to go through to get to the employment outcome. And if we don't get there, then maybe something is broken within the economy that we can't quite fix. Bank subsidies is another, is another method of stabilizing our economies, dealing with, uh, with downturns. So the idea here is that um, 
we need to fix the financial system. You know, it is essential to the health of, of the economy, and we need to um, improve uh, bank balance sheets. So the, uh, purchases like a TARP 1 or TARP 2 program would be uh, large-scale purchases of toxic financial assets that improves bank balance sheets. That um, uh, instills confidence in the creditor. And they then look for um, uh, lending opportunities. They finance investment. And then that investment will later on bring the desired employment outcome. So here, the transmission mechanism has gotten even longer. right? Um, and it works through this wealth, uh, wealth effect. Another way in which we um, manage the economy is through um, firm subsidies or direct contracts. Right? This is what we call conventional aggregate demand management. Again, we are looking to solve the problem through the private sector. So we are saying, okay, here, here are some incentives. Hire a few more people. You know, here are some contracts with guaranteed uh, profits. Um, accelerated depreciation, various cost reduction measures, and the idea is that that will instill confidence in the firm and the entrepreneur, and then they will create um, more investment growth, and employment will be a byproduct of it. Again, um, we, where the, because the philosophy, the neoliberal philosophy, is that we have to work through the private sector, we are only looking for, for solutions that, um, that stimulate private investment and growth. So this investment-led growth <coughs> model has failed. It hasn't worked. It has never produced full employment, ever. And yet it is the conventional uh, approach to uh, dealing with, with the economy. And so because we know it doesn't, it doesn't create full employment, jobless recoveries have become uh, the norm. Right? We have now resigned ourselves, but that's the most that we can do. What I will talk in a moment um, is that it's not just that we have more job seekers than there are vacancies, but the way we actually stimulate the economy through these various channels erodes income inequality between labor and capital and within labor. Get to that. Um, so uh, what happens uh, within labor? Well, I, I gave you an indication already. In the, uh, in the job search process, right? it's the game of musical chairs. So what happens is the high skill, high tech, high education people win out. They experience virtually no unemployment. Very little short spells of unemployment. Um, small dips right, in employment trends, shorter spells, and later they are what we call first fired, last, first hired, last fired. Low skill, um, low education, et cetera, are those who experience the most prolonged spells of unemployment, the biggest, the, the largest uh, amount of layoffs, the earliest uh, declines in employment. So they are the last uh, hired, first fired. And so what we've got is a virtuous employment cycle and a vicious employment cycle. And unemployment, surprise, surprise, is always concentrated at the bottom where people have the greatest difficulty sort of latching onto the economic ladder and staying there. So what we need to do as policy is not to somehow work through these incentives through the private sector, but quite directly address and break the vicious cycle that creates and perpetuates unemployment. So here you've got you know, a, a situation where um, because you have more stable employment opportunities, longer job tenure, the opportunities for income growth are better if you are in the labor market, if you're high skilled and high, um, high wage. But for those at the bottom, the opportunities of wage growth are smaller. So you've got this, this other sort of inequality where uh, within, within labor itself you um, have a, um, um, uh, an erosion in income distribution. So this is a, a chart you, many of you have probably <laughs> seen, um, and it shows how long it takes to recover the lost payrolls in a recession. And what the <coughs> chart shows you is that in the, since the um, since 81, see the purple line here is 81, um, the black line is 90, ni uh, nine, 90 uh, the brown is 2001, and the red here is 2007, it's taken longer and longer and longer to recover the lost payrolls. So this agile American economy, right, is really not creating jobs. 
Um, and my point is that our failure to solve the unemployment problem early will prevent us from solving it later because we are embedding within our labor markets these vicious cycles of long-term unemployment, of unemployability. So, so what seemed to be a, a difficult problem in the 70s is now more intractable today. Um, so let's talk a little bit about inequality. Well, here is a uh, rich poor jobs gap. You, uh, unemployment um, for those who are earning less than 20,000 dollars a year is 21 percent. Those 150,000 above is 3.2 percent. Again, you know, virtually no unemployment for the well-to-do. Underemployment mirrors this image. So we've got um, uh, another way of looking at these vicious cycles that are brewing um, at the bottom of the income distribution. Underemployment is 40 percent um, and seven, only 7.2 percent for, for the well-to-do. So this is, this is the chart that many of you have seen that um, I put together a couple of years ago. And uh, it, you know, it garnered a lot of attention. Um, what this chart shows you is how income growth is distributed between the top 10% and the bottom 90% during expansions. The, the, the question is, when, the in, when income grows, who gains? Right? Does a rising tide lift all boats? Right? So that's, that's what I'm looking at. You can look at it by business cycle. I've looked at it in many different ways. But this one is important because the argument is, as long as you produce growth, everything will be fine. But what this chart demonstrates is that over time, growth delivers gains to select few. All of the growth in the last two expansions has gone to the top 10%. And in the last expansion, in fact, more than 100% incomes for the bottom 90% have been falling while the economy was growing. So they are really not experiencing the recovery. And most people are looking at this chart and they're saying, look at you know, what a horrible thing happened in the 70s and in the 80s, you know, a completely lopsided economy. And so they, they concentrate on sort of the latter part of the, uh, of, of the chart. The one that, that I... I, like worried me, is the first part of the chart. Now, why is it that during the golden age of American economy, when we experienced expansions, fewer and fewer of the shares were going to the bottom 90%? Okay, not a dramatic trend. Clearly, the majority of the income growth went to the bottom 90%, but that share was shrinking. And so that, to me, um, tells me that the way we are uh, we are growing, the way we have um, uh, used policy right, has, has delivered uh, fewer and fewer gains um, to the bottom 90%. Now, it, this is not an ideal chart because the top 10% are is a very kind of mixed group. And so I've looked at it by 99 versus 1% and 99.99 versus 0.01%. And that one is even more shocking because you have a tiny, tiny sliver of households in the US 0.01% that are taking over a third of the income growth. Right? It, is, it, it is the rise of the 0.01%. Um, so, so basically, what this is telling us is that growth brings more inequality. But it doesn't have to be that way because growth is a policy choice. Let me look, show you the, the graph for Sweden. So, um, it is in the later period, the last few decades, it's the same thing. It, even in, in Sweden, you see the shares, the, the majority of growth going to the top 10%. But in the 60s and the 70s, it was the opposite. A greater share of that growth went to the bottom 90%. And that increased uh, with a, a, a few of the expansions during their golden era. Well, we know that you know Sweden is um, you know, has had one of the few long-standing um, uh, policy uh, commitments to full employment. It's called the corporatist model, where labor, unions, uh, uh, companies, and government uh, have coordinated in an explicit way to, uh, to produce full employment and guarantee employment um, over, the, um, over the long run. 
Now, with uh, the dawn of neoliberalism, uh, the Swedish model was slowly dismantled um, and abandoned. And surprise, surprise, we see very quickly uh, income inequality erode there as well. So this should not be a surprise. If your policy commitment is to stabilize the incomes of the wealthy or bankers, their incomes are going to go first. Right? If you're deriving your income from financial markets and your policy is to stabilize uh, asset prices, buy up uh, toxic financial assets, boost uh, uh, stock market, yes, their incomes are going to grow first. If your policy is to cut top marginal tax rates, then by design, you are encouraging income growth at that uh, place of the income distribution. But most of us earn our income from work. Most of us count on our wages and our salaries for our income growth. And so what we need is employment. But if your policy fails to secure employment, and that becomes a more and more difficult problem over time, then surely people who count on income from the labor market will lose out. So let's, um, let's uh, talk about what we might be able to do. Let's rethink <laughs> policy design. Well, there are a few things that we know. The public sector is the only sector that can be countercyclical. Okay. The, the, the private sector doesn't wake up one morning and say, you know, we've had enough of this crisis, let's just go spend and hire some people. Right? It's only, <laughs> it's only, <laughs> so the private sector is pro-cyclical. So the only, the only uh, sector that can do this is the public sector. Point number two, the unemployed are already in the public sector. The public sector is paying for unemployment. We, uh, beyond from paying for food assistance and unemployment insurance, we are paying for the fallout from unemployment. High incarceration rates, higher crime, uh, higher health problems, um, all of those problems that we already listed, uh, we pay them. You know, the, we pay those costs in direct and indirect way. Um, we know that the federal government has the greatest policy space because the federal government that has monetary control, sovereign monetary control, um, can choose how to spend. And thus it is responsible for the problem of unemployment. Failure to directly um, secure full employment over long, the long run is basically choosing to have an unemployment policy, right? To pay for a, you know, the existence of a uh, pool of unemployment. So as I explained, the way government spends reinforces income inequality. So the job guarantee is a jobs first solution. Fidel is going to explain the details of this program. Um, but I, um, I want to emphasize one uh, point of this program. It's through the buffer stock mechanism. We have an unemployment buffer stock today, right? We have an unemployment safety net. That's what we do. We, the private sector decides 